Uh, so I want to start by saying a lot of the research for the Indonesia case study has been done by uh, Angela Trito, who is our postdoctoral fellow at uh, IEMS. Uh, Angela and I traveled together to Indonesia last December to do field interviews. I spent several days. Angela spent several weeks. So uh, she may help me answer some of the more detailed questions that she probably knows much better than I do. Indonesia uh, is an important case. Um, and let me actually give this slide first. Um, Xi Jinping announced the road part of the Belt and Road, the Maritime Silk Road Initiative, in a speech to the Indonesian parliament. And that certainly was intentional. Indonesia uh, is the largest economy in Southeast Asia, is viewed as a, a very important uh, target of collaboration uh, in the Belt and Road Initiative. Hong Kong uh, Trade and Development Council has also listed Indonesia among the eight priority countries for Hong Kong engagement in the Belt and Road. As we look at the experience of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative in Indonesia, there's a number of questions uh, that we'd like to answer. We want to understand how the initiative is being received by people in Indonesia, businesses in Indonesia, what are the nature of the perceptions towards the Chinese investments that are now um, ongoing, and uh, also uh, how is it affecting other uh, new investments coming from China, uh, and what are the motivations for the types of projects that are being selected? And finally, what can we say about the nature of the projects in terms of their viability from a market standpoint, uh, the benefits to Indonesia's overall development, and of course, other environmental or social uh, impacts? So the whole point of what we're trying to do at our institute is to kind of now get into the nitty gritty. There's been a lot of discussion about big vision views of the Belt and Road, but we want to actually look at the reality and see what is really happening and what are the opportunities and challenges. So we, done, we did a, a number of interviews with many stakeholders uh, from uh, government folk to people in research institutes to business leaders uh, to investment promotion people uh, on the Indonesia side, on the Hong Kong side as well. Okay. So one thing that's very important to note is that uh, the starting point for China's engagement with Indonesia has been a very uh, close relationship between top leadership in the two countries. Uh, the Indonesian government, the current government, has had a positive attitude towards China's investments. Uh, and this kind of, there's a long history, of course, of relationships between uh, Indonesia and China, which has not always been smooth. So Indonesia cut off relations with China in the uh, Suharto period. And then really in the 2000s, I think China reached out. They provided assistance actually after the Asian financial crisis to Indonesia uh, and have tried to maintain a very friendly stance. And in under the... Um, the current government, there's been, the current Indonesian government, there's been kind of a revival of the relationship uh, with the signing of memorandums of understanding between Chinese. Uh, there's been a government level uh, memorandum uh, on the Belt and Road, and then a number of uh, Chinese and Indonesian companies signing memorandums of understanding. Um, and uh, strong support uh, at the national level, national government level for. Uh, trying to uh, leverage the Chinese investments in a way that can support Indonesia's development. And the current administration in Indonesia has very much put a priority on infrastructure investment, promoting uh, economic reform and growth. And so this is very consistent with thinking about ways to involve China productively. Okay, if you look at uh, some data we have on uh, FDI projects from China to Indonesia, you can see that there's been a big increase. So here, the dark bars are before Belt and Road, and the light bars are after Belt and Road, the light blue bars. And uh, the biggest increases have been in this nickel uh, stainless steel production activity, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a moment. 
Also in the energy sector, uh, coal, a number of coal-fired uh, power generation plants have been built with Chinese uh, foreign investment. Um, and uh, there's this also area, the real estate industrial parks, China has helped develop some industrial park areas uh, related to the other projects. Um, and so this has been kind of the nature of the engagement of Belt and Road. And we know as a whole there's been a big increase in FDI outflows from China to Southeast Asia. And Southeast Asia, even before Belt and Road, was the main destination of outbound FDI from China. Okay. I want to talk about uh, how uh, Chinese investments have been perceived in Indonesia. And uh, there's a very interesting kind of comparison that many Indonesian government officials and businesses make between China and Japan. And uh, that's because Japan has a much longer track record of providing foreign assistance and foreign investment to a country in, the, in areas of infrastructure. And here you can see, uh, if you look at data on where FDI is, uh, the sources of FDI into Indonesia, that uh, Japan, Singapore is the biggest, of course, Singapore um, is also, uh, like Hong Kong, is a place, it's an intermediate where some of those investments are coming from different places through Singapore as a financial hub. But then Japan is then the next biggest source of FDI. China, uh, you can see, is less, but in the last couple of years uh, is really catching up. Okay, But it's much more of a recent story for China. So when we did uh, a lot of interviews with people in Indonesia, there were a lot of, uh, people made a lot of observations about um, the differences between Chinese investment and Japanese investment. That uh, first, many of them know that they really were not very familiar with Chinese business models or working with Chinese. So, they, so that created some mistrust or uncertainty, uh, which probably can over, only be overcome with time and experience. Uh, also, there's different, big differences in, in the speed and uh, procedures that the Japanese follow when kind of planning and implementing investment. They're very methodical. They take their time, lots of feasibility studies, uh, whereas China moves very fast or is willing to move very fast. And that can be, of course, both a strength and a weakness of the Chinese investment. From uh, the standpoint of political leaders in, in Indonesia who have a very clear election cycle window, they probably like to see results because they feel it can help them um, uh, gain more political support. Uh, but obviously, uh, if it's done too fast, it can result in not the best planning or maybe some corners get cut, et cetera. Uh, there's, there were some reports of people feeling Chinese companies were too aggressive. Japanese uh, approach to investment, as in many social interactions, I think, is much more understated, uh, much more soft-spoken, um, and uh, Japan is, makes a point to be very compliant to all of the regulations, et cetera, um, and to be uh, patient about when and how much financing it provides. So they're very careful, and the Chinese tend to move much more quickly. Okay, so what about Hong Kong? Just a point to say that we, uh, we did ask people about also the perceptions of Hong Kong companies, and these were generally much more positive than of Chinese companies. So Hong Kong was not lumped in with China, uh, and people in Indonesia expressed uh, generally uh, a good experience with Hong Kong companies, and some Hong Kong company companies have been in Indonesia for a while, um, and also a, a, a sense of cultural affinity with uh, Hong Kong investors. Okay. One interesting thing we discovered uh, in doing the interviews in um, Jakarta w was that Indonesia had actually come up with a plan to try to steer Chinese investments under the Belt and Road to four uh, territories or four regions. And uh, the four are, are, are plotted here on the map. We have uh, North Sumatra, uh, North Kalimantan, Kalimantan, North Sulawesi, and Bali, okay? Um, and so uh, we were not really sh sure why these specific places had been chosen, but then uh, after more discussion and actually looking at some of the data, we found that 
if you look at the density of where Muslim populations reside in Indonesia, uh, one thing that's interesting is, uh, so in this uh, map, the darker shades are mean fewer Muslims, or more non-Muslims. And you can see um, three of the four territories are clearly in areas that have relatively small Muslim populations. So there is this, I think, consideration that there's some sensitivity among, uh, among Indonesians, especially uh, Muslim Indonesians, towards uh, a large China, Chinese presence. Um, now, North Kalimantan is a, a new territory, so it uh, is fairly remote and uh, also maybe helps the uh, government avoid the sensitivity that they're worried about with uh, Chinese investments coming in. Uh, so this is not unique to Indonesia, of course. In many countries, large foreign investment, uh, foreign direct investment projects can uh, be viewed negatively by local populations if there's a perception that uh, foreign companies are coming in and exploiting uh, local resources and taking all the profits out or creating projects and putting the country in a large amount of debt uh, and uh, gaining lots of benefits with limited spillovers to local development. This, or this perception can be uh, create some uh, social difficulties in the implementation of projects. Um, and I think uh, the Indonesian government uh, wants to steer Chinese investments to places that would otherwise be hard to uh, finance these types of development projects, and also to places that are not in the ma not like in downtown Jakarta, where it creates a lot of visibility and will potentially generate um, opposition. Now, uh, in the case study that we're uh, completing on Indonesia, we're focusing on some of the major projects, uh, Belt and Road projects, and uh, these are five of them. Uh, I'm going to talk today a little bit more about the first two, the Jakarta-Bandung high-speed rail project and the Morowali Industrial Park, uh, which is focusing mainly on nickel uh, mining and processing into um, stainless steel. Uh, the other ones are coal power, a huge hydro uh, power dam that's uh, going to be done in North Kalimantan, um, and the uh, Manado Bitong Toll Road, a tourism project. Um, and so let me talk about the two, the first two, and I think they yield some useful insights into some of the implementation issues for Belt and Road projects in Indonesia. So the Ch Jakarta Bandung High Speed Rail project. Uh, again, has this important feature of competition between Japan and China. So it's a 150 kilometer line that connects Jakarta with Bandung, which is the principal provincial capital of central Java, the third largest city in Indonesia. And once it's completed, you'll be able to do this trip in 30 minutes, whereas before, given the traffic and one, it is several hours. Uh, so this is being financed by uh, the China Development Bank primarily. Uh, and may open up other opportunities uh, to develop the areas along the, the new rail line. Um, and, uh, but the difficulty was that this project actually has been discussed in Jakarta for many years. It's not a new idea that came after the Belt and Road started. It was, if, if you go back to uh, the early 2010 decade, uh, the Japanese had already proposed uh, this plan and, and, and completed a feasibility study uh, for, for this project uh, that, let me see if I can see the details here, that was uh, done in 2013, uh, completed and delivered to the president in 2014. Uh, but, you know, that's around when the Belt and Road Initiative was being discussed. So uh, when... Uh, the president of Indonesia, uh, Jokowi, he visited China. He signed a memorandum of understanding uh, for China to do this project, the Char Jakarta-Bandung line, as a way to promote 
the uh, China-Indonesia partnership. Uh, but then, of course, the Japanese complain and saying, you know, what's the deal? We designed it originally, and now you're giving it to the Chinese. So then the government changed its mind and said, we'll have a, a competition. You'll, we'll, we'll accept proposals from both sides and then make a decision. But of course, it, very soon after that occurred, they awarded it back to the Chinese. So it was kind of just an exercise to be Japanese. And then later they did uh, award a separate project, a medium speed rail from Jakarta to uh, Surabaya, which is also a large city and much farther away than uh, Bandung. Um, so that's just kind of the background. And, and one of the incentives of the president may have also been that China promised to deliver this project quickly. Uh, and with good financing terms, et cetera. So I'm sure the Chinese bid, as, it, as they normally do in most countries, are, have very attractive terms. And the Japanese, in these contexts, they usually have high prices and high quality and a slower timeline. And so that's the nature of the choice. Okay, so uh, now the difficulty this project faced ultimately was that uh, the government had difficulty reaching its land acquisition goals to go to go forward with the project. In other words, to build this uh, Jakarta Bandung line, they have to acquire the land uh, for the rail to be built upon, linking the two areas, uh, and they failed. And so the question is, what was the reason for the failure? And it turns out that in Indonesia, this is a frequent problem when they want to do large infrastructure projects. The land acquisition is extremely problematic politically. Uh, people try to hold up the, the project in various ways. And so the project has been delayed. And so this reflects the fact that local capacity, local institutional problems or political problems can also be important barriers for Belt and Road projects in different countries. Um, and Indonesia, although it's a, now a large economy uh, growing at a decent rate, it still has these internal difficulties in getting things done. It also doesn't do very well yet in the ease of doing business index, international index. So local capacity is also an important factor. Um, there have been also a lot of discussion about whether this is even a good project. Uh, it's a very short rail line for a high-speed rail. So some people feel its development impact and whether it really adds value is very limited uh, given, given those given the short length. Um, and so, uh, but others argue that, you know, it's still a good project. It's going to uh, really help link Bandung to Jakarta uh, in terms of integrating the two cities and can generate jobs and ease congestion uh, that's uh, hampering the transportation currently. But of course, that's another aspect of the criteria that we need to use to assess the quality of projects under the Belt and Road. Okay, then the other project I want to talk about briefly is the Morawali Industrial Park. And um, this was established originally in 2009, um, and it includes nickel, pig iron mining, and the production of stainless steel slabs, high carbon ferrochrome, and stainless steel cold rolling. Uh, so it's a very large, project, uh, it's, there's been a, a, about a $3 billion of investment up to the present. And uh, here you can see that uh, if you just look at nickel production in different, uh, in the top producers around the world, uh, with the new um, uh, output of nickel products, uh, since the implementation of this product now, there's been a huge increase from Indonesia. Now Indonesia is actually now the biggest producer in the world of nickel-related products. It has, this is a major kind of resource, or resource endowment that the country has. Um, and one of the goals of the park and the project are to uh, capture more of the value added from the nickel resources in Indonesia. In other words, before, Indonesia would just export the nickel and then it would be processed into stainless steel and other products in other countries because Indonesian didn't have that processing capacity. But with Chinese partners now, they're gonna do it all in-house. So they're now they're producing stainless steel and then exporting. In fact, Indonesia actually banned its uh, producers from exporting nickel directly 
uh, without special permission in order to incentivize them to process it, figure out ways to process the nickel um, uh, before sending it out. Um, now, the project, so in some ways you can think this, is, this makes a lot of sense. Indonesia has a resource. It would like to develop a capacity to process it. China has experience doing this. And uh, unlike in earlier periods of Indonesian's history, when the people, the firms coming from China tend to be like the second or third rate firms who couldn't compete in China, in this case, they're getting the, by far the best producer in China coming with very good technology to process the nickel, produce, help produce the stainless steel. And so you can think of this as being very beneficial economically um, uh, for Indonesia. But there have been complaints, for instance, that uh, these factories are hiring many, many of the workers are Chinese and they're not hiring locals. And some of the Chinese are coming over maybe illegally without the appropriate work permits. Um, and so of course this are, then feeds into this issue about the negative perceptions towards uh, Chinese FDI, um, which can become politically sensitive in a you know primarily Muslim country that has had a history of uh, not always smooth relationships, ethnic relationships. Okay, so this I think these cases I sh think should give you a feeling for uh, some of the factors that really are affecting what projects are being picked and what are potentially some of the benefits, but also some of the uh, challenges and difficulties of doing uh, Belt and Road investments in uh, lesser developed countries. So this is just the concluding slide. The Belt and Road has provided uh, a new platform for engagement between China and Indonesia in the areas of investment and trade. Uh, it, it, the, a good foundation has been laid by the uh, foreign relations between top leaders in the two countries. Um, and that China has tried to be accommodating to Indonesian requests on where they should be investing uh, and other, other aspects. But still, there's still a lot of uh, challenges, some related to trust and percept negative perceptions of Chinese companies and perhaps limited experience still working with uh, Chinese companies. Um, of course, China China's now uh, does bring s some valuable uh, technology in making high-speed trains and processing capacity. Um, uh, uh, but uh, there are also local kind of factors which maybe inhibit the smooth implementation of these projects and so reduce maybe the, uh, real, the ability to realize the full potential of Chinese engagement in Indonesia. Okay, so let me stop there. Um, and turn it over to Nabahar.